Let us pray. Eternal God, I ask you now, dear God, to hide me behind the cross. Speak through me. Speak regardless of me. Speak in spite of me. Do that which you would have me to do, and I pray that your word may go forth. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Now, I know it's Resurrection Sunday. See, I got the cross and all and everything. Yeah, I know it's Resurrection Sunday. I know. I couldn't afford to put a tomb in here. <laughs> if I could, I would, and then show you it's empty. But it couldn't get that big of a rock in here. Right, Sylvia? <laughs> all right. I know it's Resurrection Sunday. But today, I'm going to divert a little, going back to the death. Because as far as I'm concerned, if you don't understand the death, then you can't understand how you're celebrating the resurrection. So this morning, just bear with me. I'll tie the resurrection back in at the end so you understand what is happening. But many times people are confused when it comes to the crucifixion of Jesus. You know, yes, we all know the story. Some man there out in the, you know, Jerusalem, whereabouts, somewhere like that. He came and he went on the cross and he was nailed and died. But how does this Jesus dying on the cross affect me? Now, the question many persons ask, and I get it regularly, can someone explain the crucifixion for me? Just explain it in a nutshell. And don't take all day doing it. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> Because you are now in the right place at the right time, and I will do this for you. So my sermon title this morning is, What Did the Crucifixion Do for Me? And you realize that's a question. And I will try to answer this question. As a matter of fact, I'm going to answer this question by the time the message is finished. What did the crucifixion do for me? Now let me tell you the first thing that happened when the crucifixion happened was this. The crucifixion gives us full access. I mean, you're like, what, what kind of access are you talking about? The crucifixion gives full access. Let me explain. Now if you want to see the President of the United States, you don't just walk up to the White House, open the gate, hey guards, how are you doing? Yeah, it's just me. Go to the front door, or just open and say, hey, Mr. President, I'd like to have a word with you. It doesn't happen. <laughs> you do not have access to do so. Right? So many persons, that's the best way for you to understand what I'm saying. Not everybody had access. Now, let me tell you something. With God, you have full access to do this now. You can go anywhere, you could be in any part in the world, and you could be by a river, you could be in a car, anywhere, and you can pray to God. You have access to Him. But let me tell you something. It wasn't always like that. What? What are you saying, Pastor? For us to understand this, we have to go back in time to the Old Testament. Now, even though back in the Old Testament, they had their altar built, you know, they put the little stones on top of each other and they would pray and offer sacrifices, right? They were given specific times to approach God. Can you believe that? And to make matters worse, even though they had their own little altar at home or where they dwell, every year the people had to journey to the temple, wherever it was at that time, just to give their sacrifice so that the high priest could offer an atonement for the people. Can you imagine that? So all of them, I don't care whether you lived in Meyerstone, wherever your temple is, everybody had to journey with their little cow or their little turtle dove or whatever you were offering or your goats, and you try to make sure that kept alive until you get where the high priest is, and the high priest had to do this. Now, when the high priest was doing all of this, he would take the sacrifice, you know, he had people working with him, and they would do all of the stuff, prepare it, and then the high priest would have to go behind a special curtain. They had to go behind that curtain. Now, let me tell you this. Only the high priest had access to this. It was called the Holies of Holy. 
So in other words, if you felt brave and decided, well, high priest can do this, I can do it too, and you went behind there, God would strike you dead. Old Testament we're talking about here. It was so sacred that when the high priest was going, now listen, when this garment was designed, there were bells at the bottom of the garment. Now, I always wondered, why did God put bells at the bottom of the high priest's garment? Now, it's not said in the Bible, but I studied Jewish history. And studying Jewish history, you find out that since only the high priest could go behind there, if the high priest was messing around and nobody knew, and he was in there, and they didn't hear, tinkle, 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 they went, uh-oh. <laughs> And so they usually tied a rope around his waist or a rope around his ankle. And if they didn't hear, tinkle, 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 they said, okay, dead man, and pull him out. That's how serious the holies of holy was. And let me tell you something. That's a lot of work. Can you imagine all of you had to carry stuff for me to do all of that? Man, I don't want that job if that's the no, You keep it. <laughs> That's a whole lot of work. But listen to this. When Jesus was crucified, when he was crucified and died on the cross of Calvary, the curtain that separated the rest of the world from the holies of holies ripped from top to bottom. This was the first time anybody apart from the high priest was seen behind this curtain. And you're like, why is that so important? Well, what happened is that Jesus just bumped us up to VIP. What VIP are you talking about? Very important priest. <laughs> That's what we all became. We now could access the holies of holies without having a high priest. In other words, if somebody is having a problem in church now, and pastor is vacationing in Jamaica, relaxing on a beach, you don't have to take a plane and come to me for me to pray for you. You get where I'm going. You can now access God on your own. So we have an access card. We have all been bumped up to VIP. But I know some persons might say, Pastor, where's the proof in this? I want to show you that we are VIPs. Look at this verse here. Matthew 27, 50 to 51a. And I'm reading from the Amplified Version because I want everybody to understand what's happening here. And Jesus cried out again with a loud, agonized voice. This is him dying on the cross of Calvary. And he gave up his spirit voluntarily, sovereignly, dismissing and releasing his spirit from his body in submission to his father's plan. And at once, the veil of the holies of holies of the temple was torn in two from where? Top to bottom. This curtain was so thick that when they were packing it and putting it up together, you had special people to carry. You couldn't just push it and go in between it. But no, it was torn apart that anybody could now see and have access to the Holy of Holies. I want to give you another verse that shows you now that we have access, how we should come to our God. Listen to this in Hebrews 10 verse 19. Therefore, believers... Children of God, that's what it's saying there. Since we have confidence, now we have confidence we can come to God. And full freedom, now we got freedom too, right? To enter what? The holy place. The place where God dwells by means of what? The blood of Jesus. So now everybody is given an access card. But we must understand, even though you are given an access card, you must use it. That's as simple as I can put it. No, the other thing that the crucifixion offers is his blood. The crucifixion offers his blood. Animals were not enough. 
They were used, but they were not enough for atonement. And so it would continue to be a continuous cycle of us butchering animals to sprinkle blood so that things would be like, um, an atonement could be given. Humanity needed a sacrifice that could last once and for all. This blood had to be sinless. This blood had to be pure. The only blood that fit that criteria was the blood of Jesus Christ. Again, I want to show you from scripture that I'm not making this stuff up. Leviticus 17 verse 11. Look what God was saying to the children of Israel. For the life of a creature is in the what? The blood. And I have given it to you to make what? Atonement for yourselves. On the what? Altar. Old Testament. See, I ain't making this stuff up. They were doing that. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. They had all the animals to do it. And so, if Jesus never came, we would still have to be doing it. I'm just letting you know what's happening here. This is the crucifixion. But look what happened in Ephesians 1, verse 7. Look at this verse now. It says, In him, not me, this is Jesus. In him we have redemption. That is our deliverance and salvation through his what? Blood. The crucifixion offers blood, which paid the penalty for our sin and resulted in the forgiveness and complete pardon of our sin in accordance with the riches of his grace. What is his grace? Undeserving favor. So the blood was shed for us once and for all. But let me be clear about something. I need you to get this. I'm going to show you from this example. Now, if you're sitting outside on a cold night, ooh, it's cold, and there is a blanket beside you, you have a choice. Freeze to death, <laughs> or take and wrap the blanket and wrap it around you. But there is a choice. Let me tell you this. Crucifixion offers the blood but if man does not accept what was done on the cross of Calvary, that means if he doesn't give his life to God, if he doesn't give his heart to God, then the blood remains at the foot of the cross. You see, God did his thing. Everybody has a choice. And so it's up to us whether we want the blood to remain at the foot of the cross or we want to do what is right and give our hearts over to God. Third and finally, we realize, of course, that the crucifixion offers the blood. This is what the crucifixion offers as well. The crucifixion offers eternal security. What Jesus did on the cross can affect your life now and can affect your life when you die. What? You didn't know? Then why is everybody claiming to go to heaven? Listen, I'm still waiting on the funeral that I go to. That somebody's not going to heaven. <laughs> Never been to church 50 years. <laughs> and he's going to heaven. Never believed in God. And he's going to heaven. Did the worst things. He's up there smiling. No, he ain't. <laughs> Come on now. There's, that's some sweat beads down there. Come on. <laughs> I'm being realistic here. And people need to know this. The crucifixion gives eternal security. What Jesus did on the cross affects us. Now let me tell you this. We don't realize, but what Jesus did on the cross was for us. It wasn't for himself. He didn't need to die to bring himself. He did it for us. He didn't need to die to bring back himself for himself. He did it for us. If we don't accept in faith what Jesus did on the cross, then the blood cannot be applied to cover our sins. Remember, we read it, right? Jesus' crucifixion is our ticket 
to eternal security. But guess what? Amen. The baby said yes. <laughs> yep, I agree with you. <laughs> Jesus' crucifixion is the ticket to eternal security. And if we don't accept that ticket in faith, then it cannot be used. No, I want to give you one verse in this section. I'm not even going to give you two. And I'm going to give you the simplest of verses. John 3, verse 6. And everybody's like, oh yeah, I know that, Pastor. I learned it in Sunday school. Yeah. So it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. See, Pastor, I can't even say it. But let me tell you something. This is one of the most used verse in the Bible. Anywhere you go, most people learn this verse first. But it's one of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible. <gasps> what are you saying, pastor? All the other pastors were wrong? No. I'm saying all of them didn't take the time out to break it down for you. And so I am going to break it down. I want to look back at that verse in John 3, 16. Now, if you notice, when you look at that verse you will see the word that whoever believes. Now, go back to the other slide, please. Yep, that one. That's the one I want to see. Thank you. If you look at that, it says, whosoever believes in him. Right? Believes. Now, let me tell you something about believes. Believe can be on knowledge-based, and believe can be on committal-based. What? Well, let me explain. I'm going to break it down for you this morning because I want you to get it. And for you to get it, I'm coming down. <laughs> keep, keep your eyes on this because I want you to see what's happening. Ladies and gentlemen of the church, what is this? How do you know it's a chair? From your knowledge. When you were a child, they told you. Mommy said, chair? Chair? Remember? <laughs> so you know this is a chair. You believe this is a chair. From the knowledge that you grew up with, this is a chair. Yes. Let me give you another one. Is there the devil? I believe there is a devil. Some people might say, well, you haven't met him. Have you ever met him? So I don't believe there is a devil. Well, I've never met the president of the United States. <laughs> and I believe there is one. <laughs> Based on the knowledge that I have, I believe there's a president. Based on the knowledge I have, I believe there's a devil, so I don't have to meet him. Yeah, so I believe there is a devil. But let me give you the other belief. This is, that was belief on knowledge. Let me give you the belief that comes with commitment, that comes with faith, that comes with trust. It's going to be very quick, so pay attention as I demonstrate this very hard task. Huh? Pastor, I missed it. What did you do? I know the hand is quicker than the eye, but it wasn't the hand that was working. Let me tell you something. Did I think for a minute to sit down? Did I say, I wonder if this chair is going to hold me? Was this chair built in 1727 like the church? <laughs> I didn't think about it. I just sat in the chair. When I sat in the chair, what did I exercise? I exercised my faith in the chair. I committed to the chair without even thinking. I trusted in the chair. I relied on the chair. I put my faith in the chair, and I sat in the chair. Let's go back to the verse. See, I want to teach you something this morning. It's still Resurrection Sunday, but I need you to understand what is happening. Now we can go to the other verse. Let's read this verse again, but with what we just learned. This is how it should be read. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes, which means commits to, who you're committing to Jesus, relies on, who you're relying on, Jesus, and puts his faith in him, still Jesus, should not perish, but have eternal life. You see, John 3, 16 is trying to tell persons that they need to commit to, they need to trust in, and they need to rely on Jesus. 
Don't expect eternal security when we have not done our part. That's it, you know. Everybody wants eternal security. But did you commit to? Did you trust in? Did you rely on? And I'm not talking about just believe now. That's the thing. So if you're just saying, yeah, I believe there's a God. Believe there's a God is not enough. I believe there's a devil. Do I believe in him? No. I don't serve the devil. So I go over to the other side. Yeah, do I believe there is a God? Yeah. But if you haven't believed in him and commit, then you're not one of his. I'm just giving you here the crucifixion. We need to understand Jesus already did his part, so we have to do ours. Now, for the conclusion, I didn't leave out the resurrection. Don't worry, I'm going there. So this morning's message was not about resurrection, pastor. I don't see why you had to do all of that. With crucifixion was Good Friday. You don't need to go back to that. But let me tell you something. I believe with all my heart that if you don't understand the death, then you truly cannot celebrate the resurrection. But Jesus, I came pastor to hear about Jesus risen this morning. That's why I come on good, you know, on resurrection Sunday. I came to hear it. But it's useless to celebrate the resurrection if you don't understand the death. And that's where I'm going this morning. Listen, I want to give you the resurrection in a few sentences. I'm not saying it's not important. But I'm giving it to you in a few sentences so you can understand why and how we get to celebrate. Look at this. And I put it up there so you can see it. Celebration of the resurrection comes, through, comes from us having full access to God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. This leads to all who have accepted by faith what took place on the cross. Allowing us to be resurrected to live with Jesus, our Savior, for eternity. So that's what the resurrection is. The resurrection is based on what took place with the death. And so you cannot ha get all excited about the resurrection if you don't understand the death. Today would be futile, useless, nothing to us if we have not accepted the death. And so one does not work without the other. So to answer your question, remember that question that I posed this morning? What did the crucifixion do for me? It allowed me and every believer to access salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we are celebrating his resurrection today, tomorrow, and even after we die for all eternity. This is what the crucifixion did. It allows you not only to celebrate the resurrection, but to embrace it. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Eternal God, we thank you and we praise you, dear God, for your word that has gone forth. So many times, dear God, we just look at these days as just a holiday. Oh, it's Good Friday. Oh, it's Holy Thursday. Oh, it's Easter Sunday. Oh, and we don't even realize the significance. We get up and we say, yeah, yeah, this is the Sunday I go to church. This is the Sunday we celebrate the resurrection. But how can you celebrate a resurrection if you have not accepted the death? How can you celebrate what he has done for you if you don't appreciate what was done before? The two are one big event. And so many times we try to separate them. But we need to understand, dear God, without death, there is no resurrection. And without resurrection, that means nobody died. It's one thing, dear God. And I pray today that your word has gone forth and touched the hearts and minds of individuals that they might think 
and understand that what was done on the cross of Calvary was for us. The shed blood was for us. And until we all accept it, which is to commit to, trust in, and rely on Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, then right now, we're celebrating with others who will be celebrating with him in eternity. And when eternity comes, then our names will not be there. So we thank you, dear God, for your word. And we know your word won't go void. It will go and do that which it has set out to do. In Jesus' mighty name, as you taught us to say, Our Father, Amen.